I'd like to invite Dr. Nessel and, and, uh, and Tom um, to join. There's three chairs and there's two of you, so you get full choice. And <laughs> we won't have music and take one away, so you can <laughs> take whichever one you want. Uh, and please, those who are sitting, uh, who are standing in the back, there's more space in the front. And what we're going to have is uh, just time for you to ask questions. We have some volunteers who have uh, microphones, I believe, um, but in the meantime, you can also just raise your hand and speak loudly. <laughs> Um, and so then we have about 15 minutes, um, and then we'll have our book signing uh, session while we have our break. <coughs> Hi, thanks very much for coming. I just want to point out the moringa, the malongai leaves. You can buy them at Alamany Farmers Market, which is, you know, tragically unhip and everything, but it's good stuff. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Tragically unhip. You can get it at Vicks as well. In so, some of the sambars. Vicks Indian Restaurant. Yeah. Hi, um, I had two questions, one for Marion, and I'm here in the front. <laughs> one for Marion and one from Tom. Um, first of all, great, great talks. Thank you for really laying out the, um, you know, the road here. Um, so for Marion, I, I wanted to know, uh, you, you know, you talked about education, and so how can we, uh, you know, link uh, nutrition, education, nutrition in the schools? I mean, things have been done, but it doesn't look like, Things work very well. I mean, we have here the schoolyard project in Berkeley. It seems like they, they start to have some problems. So is there anything that we can do to, like, move that forward? And then for Tom, the question that I had for you is, um, do you have any idea for, like, ethnobotany in the urban environment, and how do you approach that? Um, I don't know what to say about education. I think it's easier to change the environment, and I'm really excited that the Department of Agriculture has new rules for school food that will make the food healthier. Um, I worry, in, I mean, if you're going to do nutrition education in schools, you've got to train teachers. Um, you can't just have people saying whatever they think. They need to know something about nutrition. So you want to start a big education project to train teachers. Get into the education schools. In terms of urban ethnobotany, it's rich, it's wonderful. If you look at a place like the Bay Area, there's hundreds and hundreds of ethnolinguistic groups that have come in. And a, a place that I find is a real nexus of this information is when I see patients in the clinic in Oakland or Richmond, and I create an environment for them to talk about what are you doing at home in terms of uh, your, your medicines and your foods, and I find out all the things they're growing in their backyards. And... Uh, and, and so that is a form of ethnobotany that's very applied, that's particularly strong within the different ethnolinguistic groups. Now you'll hear about some of the work of uh, Professor Altieri, and he's doing work on urban uh, community gardens and so forth, and that is a, a form of nutritional ethnobotany, bringing in all mm -hmm. those. But certainly the King Middle School and uh, the work of Alice Waters with the edible schoolyards. I have a daughter in that school right now. Ava has a son yeah, in that school. Yeah, that's fantastic. And they're just, my they're just mm -hmm. mind-blowing what's, what's going on. What the kids are learning uh, is, is great. So there are, there are models, and they hear about your work. They hear about <laughs> Michael Pollan's work. And it's it's wonderful. Yeah, it's incredible. They, they, it's, it, my son is there, and he, I mean, he just they have these cook-offs, and he, you know, like, with like 0.04 percent from first place with a kale bruschetta. I was like, what? I mean, he's 12. <laughs> no, but he loves cooking. I mean, he cooks with me. He loves cooking. It's amazing. Alice Waters, you know, from Chez Panisse, they have this. They have they grow their own food organically, and then they have this beautiful kitchen. It's like about this big, and they they cook regularly. It's amazing, and they actually, my son loves it. They're like the 15th coolest school in the nation. It turns out and it's because of this. So, so nutrition can be cool, too. As we know, but now they know, too. So it's really neat. Hi. Over here, I have a microphone. Thank you so much, Marion and Tom. Wonderful talks. I'd actually love to get both of your opinions on this, but particularly Tom. Um, you spoke about the uh, vitamin A deficiency and the miracle of the palm oil as a local solution. And I'm sure that many of us in the room, as we were hearing you talk about this, were thinking about something that's very much in the news, which is the GMO development of the uh, golden rice, uh, which is rice which actually has a gene introduced in order to fortify it with vitamin A. And I was wondering, have you... 
Um, what is your opinion on that as a solution as opposed to something like palm oil? And is there ever a forum where you find yourself in discussion with people who are developing these things and sort of showing the range of solutions that are out there? Okay, well, I think first of all, any food that is going to serve to increase vitamin A levels in the bellies of kids needs to get into their bellies. So if, if you've got a certain crop, what, what diversity of habitats can it grow in, okay? Uh, what kind of chemical, uh, fertilizer, irrigation inputs does it need? And is it going to displace the local agriculture of these people? Because this study I showed, social, sci uh, social science and, and medicine, how just by having access to land in a garden will uh, lower the levels of vitamin A deficiency. So if the golden rice is produced in such a way as it's not di displacing small farmers, uh, it, it could have positive effects. But you need to look at the whole effect. If they're growing it in the Punjab and sending it to cities uh, throughout India, that, that could be positive. But if it's displacing traditional varieties of rice, which have many colors in them, okay, and also their ability to grow other carotene-rich foods within their gardens, if that's being disruptive by yet another homogeneous uh, crop being grown on a large scale, that's a problem. So it's, it's all a matter of how it's done. Can I comment on that? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> in my book, Safe Food, The Politics of Food Safety, I discuss golden rice at length. That book came out in 2003, and one of the things I did in it was I, I have a great big long table of all of the steps that you would need to go to to bring, you need to go through to bring golden rice to market and actually have it used and demonstrate that its beta carotene is converted to vitamin A in the body and that it does what it's supposed to do. Um, so now it's 10 years later and it's still not on the market. It's working its way through those steps very, very slowly um, <clears throat> for a variety of reasons, some of them political, some of them just biological. Um, it's been very, very difficult to get it to market. It's got a lot of changed genes in it, so it's not very stable in the fields. Um, and it's very unclear whether the yellow rice will be accepted by the population, how they're going to get it, who's going to sell it, how much it's going to cost. There are lots and lots of social issues around it. Um, and to me, I mean, its main purpose is to act as a poster child for genetically modified foods. It's at last something that's useful to people. Um, so you can't criticize it because if you criticize it, you're accused of... Uh, sentencing millions of people to blindness. But there are all these foods around that have beta carotene in them. I don't, it seems like just another food with beta carotene and um, one that a lot of fuss is being made about. It would be much better if you could get mangoes to, to people in, who have mangoes growing nearby. So but anyway, it's in safe food. It's amazing how well that book, which is 10 years old, has held up on some of those things. I just, oh, uh, sorry, I have a, uh, actually I was going to piggyback on the question around genetic modification because I think <clears throat> that complexity of the debate, especially around golden rice, for example, knowing some of the people who st started that research were basically people who grew up very poor in Punjab where they didn't, didn't have access to a lot of these questions. And so I think the complexity of this debate um, I guess I'm asking really the question of how do you simplify the debate or who are the people who we're supposed to be bringing together in terms of advocacy around these issues of, of the relationship between agriculture and food? Because I feel like the conversation around genetic modification in the United States is one that comes from... It simplifies the conversation too much. And I'm just curious from your standpoint what your thoughts are around how do we incre increase the complexity of the discussion but yet keep it um, something that we can talk about politically and in an advocacy type of way. I don't, that was a very long-winded way of saying it. Yeah, I, I hate to keep talking about my own work, but it's my own work. <laughs> so, um, so in Safe Food, I set up uh, a comparison of genetically modified foods and um, microbiological 
hazards, you know, food outbreaks, and and use the risk communication literature to talk about how um, people's views of biological hazards have to do with how familiar they are, how complicated, how scientific, how technological, um, and lots of control issues. And to me, the issue of genetically modified foods is not one necessarily of food safety. It's really hard to prove that they're safe or unsafe. There's not much evidence for unsafety, but it's hard to prove that they're safe. Um, but there are lots of issues about corporate control of the food supply that are very, very important in that, that are much harder for people to talk about. You can't talk about corporate control of the food supply. Uh, or you get into trouble, you get called names. Uh, but you can talk about food safety. So food safety has been used, I argue in, in my book, Safe Food, I argue that food safety is a surrogate for conversation about much more complex issues. And that it's just because it's so politicized at this point, the, the groups talk past each other. Um, and nobody is going to have a nuanced discussion about it because if you criticize anything about genetically modified foods, you're criticizing science. Um, and I don't think that's the case. I don't yeah. know how to simplify. Yeah, just getting back to the local. It's nice when local communities have control of their biological resources, and also we honor all the incredible diversity that exists out mm -hmm. there. And we, we need to support things that don't diminish that diversity, but rather bolster that diversity. So if they can do the GMO in a way that isn't going to be, you know, there, there's hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of rice varieties of many different colors and grow in many different areas. I want those to be safeguarded, not just in a seed bank, but in active agroecosystems. Mm -hmm. And those are the things that are most at risk. Okay, can we get the, yeah. <clears throat> yeah uh, actually, uh, <clears throat> golden rice has about three micrograms of beta carotene per gram of, <laughs> of biomass. So you need to eat about two kilos, which is going to take longer to cook, <laughs> actually, <laughs> to get what you're going to get from half mango. Mm. And there are weeds in the systems that are being uh, eliminated with the herbicides that go along with the, green, uh, with, the, with the golden rice, which is part of the Green Revolution package, that eliminates weeds that have 450 uh, microbiomes. So anyway, uh, my question was about <laughs> there you go. about the um, you know that when we eat is a political act and an economic act, so vote, voting with your fork is good for the people you know that are educated. Uh, kind of in, in Berkeley, you know, that go to the farmer's market and, and things like that. But, you know, with, with the control of the food system, the, the way that you describe it, I mean, all that propaganda by the, by the multinationals, Coca-Cola and so on, it's control of the food system. It's control of the food system not only because uh, the, the way they are organized, the, all these companies that are growing biomass, but actually by controlling the mind of the people. So how, you know, voting... People in this country vote based on what they perceive from the news. Who controls the news? Who Coca-Cola or all these people? So voting, I don't think it really guarantees that things are going to change. That's my opinion. There has to be a political consciousness that, that, is, that has to somehow over, overcome that huge propaganda system and the funding of the public universities by the corporations. Yeah, I'm using voting metaphorically um, as a... As, as a you know, as a metaphor for political action. And I think there's a lot of grassroots political action in this country that's having a big effect. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. just in terms of lobbying ability, these local uh, ethno-scientific systems, they are vulnerable. They do not have ability to sp speak out and having lobbying effects the way these big corporations. So we need to be aware of that, and we need to be aware of that that, that power, power differential and, and, and not let all these amazing systems become extinct, okay? Because they are becoming extinct before our eyes. Yeah, thanks for great presentations. I have a question for both of you, which is if you could imagine an ideal world, what role would the food industry play? I'm not <laughs> imagining that it's putting micronutrients in Coca-Cola, but can you think of examples where the food industry is playing a positive role in either the global or the local context? Well, I mean, you know, uh, you have large, very dense urban areas, 
and you know uh, they can produce some of their food but not all their food so there needs to be systems to move food from rural areas to, to urban areas and so an infrastructure should be in place to do that it can happen more informally if you look at our farmers markets and all the people that show up at six in the morning to put up their stands it happens informally so you know uh, that could be a place for, uh, you know, kind of the food industry, but the fact of the matter is that already happens informally. So I, 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 uh, if, if they would do it in a, in a careful way and help facilitate that, that could be positive. But, you know, I mean, in terms of GMO, I, as a physician, I was very happy when we trained a yeast to make growth hormone and, and, and also insulin, okay? That was GMO that was appropriate, Okay. And, uh, but the whole idea of genetically modifying our food so that somebody owns that food uh, is, is, is a very, very different thing. So I, 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 it's, it's difficult for me to understand where, where they're going to fit in if the profit motive is, is, the, is the underlying uh, drive for this. Yeah, uh, I'm not opposed to profit. I think it's okay. It's the growth in profit that adds a dimension to it that makes it impossible for food companies to operate in a way that might benefit public health. If they could just make a profit and distribute profits to investors, that would be fine. But it's the idea that they have to continually expand the profits that puts the food industry in a position of doing things that are opposed to public health because they have to market to kids. They have to market overseas. They have to market. They're forced to expand their marketing at all times. So that, to me, is the critical factor. And that means dealing with Wall Street and regulating Wall Street, which isn't a bad idea anyway. Mm -hmm.